This is essential. 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 This is essential audio. I know we say it all the time, but get your tickets early to save big. It's the sweetest thing about Valentine's Day. Wow, that's great. You went in awe, oh, You went all. <laughs> that was very cheesy. Oh, Let's oh, not oh, use oh, that oh, one. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome back to the Money Pot Podcast from Money 2020. I'm glad to be back and to welcome my co-host this week, Sabina Osorio, Head of Marketing for Money 2020 USA. Hi, Sabina. Hey, Sanj. Yeah, it's my first time on the show. I'm kind of nervous, but really excited. You have no reason to be nervous. You'll be a natural. Today, we're talking about the new ways that the VC community is looking at financial inclusion. Financial inclusion is definitely one of my favorite topics in tech. I think the promise of tech is that it can make processes so much cheaper that more and more people can get financial services. That's supposed to ultimately help create more wealth for the consumer, because if people are in the financial system, it's easier for them to save. We all know that it's really expensive to be poor. God don't I know it. But hopefully, if you can use tech to help, you can really help build people up. Absolutely. And and that's the hope and the ultimate mission of fintech. A lot of energy has gone into financial inclusion, but we still have a long way to go. At the Money 2020 conference in October, I was talking to my friend Aryan Shute, and he was saying that the new focus is on the middle class because they're experiencing a lot of the same struggles. I totally get it. It feels like so many of us are in the middle class crunch. We make just enough to be on the grid, but a sudden emergency could really put us in trouble. And the economy seems great, but the industry is anticipating a recession, which is really scary. It definitely is. So I decided to get back to Ariane to get a better picture of how venture capitalists are looking at the problem. Well, first, can you explain who Ariane is? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Sorry, I got ahead of myself there. Ariane is the founder and managing partner of Core Innovation Capital, which has a mission to democratize prosperity. He started investing in fintech before it was called fintech. This is Ariane describing how he became so interested in financial inclusion. I learned about Muhammad Yunus and Grameen Bank, and I was just mind blown by, uh, you know, what he'd been doing in the 70s and 80s making teeny tiny loans, you know, 10 to $50 to the poorest people on the planet and uh, seeing how those loans, those financial instruments helped people get out of poverty. Um, So I gobbled the book up, went looking for who was doing that kind of stuff in the United States, made my way to Chicago where I met a bunch of hippie bankers who had been doing this kind of thing in the U S and was impressed with what, by what they'd done, realized that what they'd done didn't scale very well, started a think tank called the Center for Financial Services Innovation with Jennifer Tesher back in 2004, um, with the idea of like, how can you use technology to scale uh, better financial services for low moderate income people? And we did a lot of work with everyone from Walmart to H&R Block. So as he was doing this, He began making investments in places to scale the solutions for financial inclusion. Yeah, and like a lot of people, he was really inspired by Muhammad Yunus and the ideas behind microinvesting and the creation of Grameen Bank. I know a lot of people were really inspired by Yunus's stories about microloans to the poor and the principles of microfinance and microcredit. Um, Actually, when he won the Nobel Prize in 2006, there was a microfinance revolution going on. I find it kind of funny that he found hippie bankers in the U.S. working on the same principles. Yeah, you don't normally think of bankers and hippies in the same sentence. This would be a really good time to talk about what a VC does. Well, when I think of a venture capitalist, I think about people with a lot of money who want to invest it into companies that are going to scale and grow quickly so they can make that money back. But I also know that VCs are often integral into growing a business and are often people who have traveled the road of entrepreneurship themselves and can help advise others and help businesses connect with the people that they need to grow. And the irony is that most venture capital funds start as startups themselves. When Aryan started, he barely understood how to manage a fund. Gosh, when I started Core, I, I didn't even know what 2 and 20 meant right, which is kind of the, the, the business model for, for private equity funds, right, 2% management fee, 20% carry. Um, and uh, I mean, it took, in my case, I, I basically sat on the sidewalk at 85 Broad Street, which is the Goldman Sachs headquarters back in the day, 
um, until someone there relented. And then once Goldman came in, then the rest came in and, you know, the, that kind of got me off the ground. Uh, but it was a scrabble, you know, it was like, it was not a, it was not the kind of elegant journey, you know, from one ivory tower to the next that I think everyone pictures. Like it was a scrappy, uh, you know, at times desperate affair to get this off the ground. For any of our techie listeners who don't know a 2 and 20, it's a common fee structure that hedge funds and VC funds implement to operate. There's a 2% flat rate to pay for the management and then a 20% performance fee on the upside. So, like all entrepreneurs, getting a fund like that off the ground isn't easy. It must have made him very empathetic to his founders. So why is he talking about the change in focus to financial health for the middle class? So he got into this for exactly what you described earlier. He was angry at the payday lending industry and how they took advantage of the poor. And he thought technology should be able to help with this. There has to be a better way. But then... You know, over time, I've come to the sad, sad realization that it's not just expensive to be poor, it's expensive to be American. And, you know, like the reality today is that the majority of Americans are living paycheck to paycheck. The majority of Americans don't have enough saved for retirement. The majority of Americans uh, don't have access to $500 um, you know, if they needed to within a couple of weeks. Uh, and this is not just the plight of the poor, right? Like this is the, the run of the mill American. And so we've really opened our spigot to not just look at, you know, the under and under banks, but really to look at the, you know, the bottom three income quintiles. This reminds me of the stat that an emergency $500 expense would be a financial burden for about 63% of Americans. That's crazy. According to a Forbes article a few years ago, only 37% of Americans had over $1,000 in savings. And a third of all American families have no savings at all. We've got to change that. Yeah, there are a lot of challenges. Americans are utilizing debt to make ends meet, and even a small accident could have a dire consequence for them. I recently had a car accident and had to have surgery on my hand. When I look at the medical bills, the lost time at work, and the physical therapy, I realize that those could have been devastating to someone without insurance or someone living paycheck to paycheck. Totally. So what kind of solutions are people like Aryan looking at? What innovations are out there to help solve this problem? So, so Core and similar investors are early investors. They're at the ground floor, often described as seed or A-level rounds. That's really early on. It's really hard at that point to measure a product or service purely on metrics. The team is an important one. And we really look for teams that come at this with the same anger that we do. So people who are on a mission to fix something that they feel deeply, you know, like is broken. So that's one thing we look for. The second that we look for is a business model that has economic alignment. And too, too many financial services business are not economically aligned with their customers. That's so interesting. So he really wants people who are passionate about solving these problems. But what does he mean by economic alignment with their customers? Well, if you're going to offer solutions for financial health, you don't want a business model that charges fees for adverse circumstances. We really look for business models that work really well when the customer is, is going on the up and up. Right? So if the customer is able to repay as promised and the company is, is profitable as a function of that, great. You know, if the customer is able to save more and the company is able to make more on that, um, great. Right? So we're really looking for that kind of economic alignment. There are many specific you know, things within different verticals of the business, but high level, right? like teams that are on a mission and business models that are economically aligned with their end users. Well, that makes sense. If you're going to be a part of the solution, be a part of the solution. So are there some particular technologies that he thinks can be part of the solution? I'm assuming machine learning and AI are on the list, naturally. He, he says there are tons. Yes, machine learning and AI. He also mentioned vision, which, you know, we don't really talk about very often, which is the ability for a computer to take in non-digital information the way a human would and to be able to repurpose it, like tax statements or information within a PDF. And the other is blockchain. The other one that I feel like, you know, has had a moment and, um, and that, I, that I really believe in what is going to be transformative 
are the are the technologies surrounding the blockchain um, and cryptocurrencies. Um, and you know, I think uh, I think we're today kind of where the internet was like in 1996, right? Like post Netscape browser. Um, but basically, you know, the whole flurry of innovation that we saw in the late 90s, you know, I think we've seen in the last couple of years, you know, the lion's share of that didn't materialize at the application level. But, you know, so many of the failures and some of the successes of those time are absolutely fundamental to the infrastructure level today, right at the internet. And I think that'll be true also for blockchain. I hear that all the time and Sand, you must too. It's like people judge blockchain on the wrong criteria and forget that you need to make some mistakes on the platform to learn the right things to do. So if those are the technologies, what does he look for in a founding team? What all founders have to have, a denial about reality. Actually, he has a better answer than that. Pathological optimism, uh, extremely high energy, uh, while, you know, the type of entrepreneurship that we back is, you know, is entrepreneurship that is all very intellectual and it's deal making and code writing and such. Uh, I think of entrepreneurship almost as, as an extreme sport and it requires physical endurance and just, you know, like just a lot of physical energy, uh, to do it and to do it well. Um, we really love teams that have a chip on their shoulder. People who have tasted success, but who have not been nearly as successful as they want. And or people who grew up with some with something to prove, just something deep in their belly that, you know, like they have to prove their to the world that they can succeed. Uh, so we always look for in the, you know for things in people's backgrounds uh, that gives them that chip on the shoulder. Sounds like a successful entrepreneur in this space needs a healthy ego. Or maybe even an unhealthy one. They are trying to change the world, after all. Right. I mean, as long as the ego doesn't get in the way of learning. So, how was your first episode? Have any fun? Yeah, I actually did. Once my blood pressure came down and I wasn't as hot, it was great. I mean, will you have me back? Absolutely. We want to thank Ariane Shute for being our guest this week. Yes, and don't forget that we've got a price break this week. We say it often, but get your tickets to our show before Valentine's Day. The price is only twenty one ninety five, and it'll be the sweetest savings you'll experience all year. I, I, I could see that right now. Champagne, roses, and a Money 2020 pass. <laughs> I love it. And the call for content goes out mid-March for Money 2020 USA. Also, if you haven't already, go subscribe to this podcast, The Money Pop, wherever you listen to your podcasts. Thank you so much for listening. We'll be back next week with an episode on VC activity in Africa. Until then. Bye. This is Essential. 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 This is Essential Audio.